The Lord will always lift you up in His strength when others tear you down. Born in Iran to an Iranian father and American mother, Moody Malavi found at an early age how to read the comedic moments in any situation. His family moved to the United States in 1981 where Moody used his funny personality to escape multitudes of adverse moments in his young life, bullying. Today, he's an award-winning comedian and is a tsunami on stage. His high energy and animated storytelling mannerisms are unforgettable and his light shines bright for Jesus in a dark world. This is his story. This is today's Nashville. This is Faith. Moody, you have been everywhere making people laugh. I just want to thank you so much for inviting me into your home and getting a chance to listen to your story. Thank you for coming. It was a surprise that anybody wanted to come in here and talk. You know, you have quite the past. You were born in Iran, and how in the world did you get to Nashville? Let's go back to your childhood and uh, how you got here. My mom is from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and she met my father in the 60s. He was an orthopedic surgeon. She was a nurse, and uh, they, they hit it off and decided to go back to his place, you know, a quick 10,000-mile trip east. And uh, that's, that's where we were born. My, my brothers and I were born there. The Iranian Revolution broke out, and we were probably the last of those people to leave uh, the country. And what people don't realize is uh, we got here in 1981. We left there in 1979. So there's a gap, and that gap was filled with a route through Turkey into Greece, and we stayed there for a while. And then we went to Spain, and we went to a school that was 90 miles from this fishing village that we were living in. I, uh, I, I got super sick, my oldest brother got super sick, mom was a nurse, she nursed us back to health, and she's like, I, I can't do this anymore. You know, the Iran-Iraq war had broken out by then, so she's like, I'm gonna take my kids to Chattanooga in 1981. So that was, uh, that was a wake-up call for everybody, <laughs> because I don't know if you know uh, the 1981 stuff with Iran, uh, then bringing three Iranian baby boys to the South was a little different. Now, how old were you? I was six then. Six. So how has life been since then? It's been interesting. When you're an Iranian in the South, uh, the, you know, people immediately have that, that prejudice. You know, people don't want to call it prejudice, but you know, they, they judge you before they meet you. That's prejudging. And hey, that's prejudice. And that's what happens. So we came into the country. We didn't know anything about white Americana, Southern culture. We failed the entrance exam to the Lutheran school that my mom was trying to get us into. And they said, do you have cable? Because lots of foreign children have this problem. And so mom did what every mom would do and she bought every single channel. And we saw all sorts of things that weren't ever seen in Iran. <laughs> and that's where I fell in love with comedy. So I figured if I could make people laugh, they would stop um, getting on to me that I was Iranian. So you, you mentioned you were uh, teased? Yes. So we were, uh, my brothers and I, you know, we all had the same problem where people would look at us differently and uh, they would, again, prejudge us and we would have the problems where uh, we couldn't gain friendships very quickly and, and we would have to, it was just a struggle because people didn't know what to do with us. So uh, I, I started joking I started making people laugh and that was the, how old were you when that? Oh, I was six, yeah, because I mean, I saw Eddie Murphy do it and I thought it was awesome because we had cable. So we saw all sorts of stuff. Now you lived in Chattanooga for most of your schooling? Yeah, we, we moved out of Chattanooga to uh, the Nashville area in 2019. Okay. So we were pretty much were Chattanoogans. So I went online and started looking at some of your videos. They are hilarious. Thank you. Let's talk about LSD. Oh, LSD, that's the least stressful decision. So that's how my wife, Kelly, and I live. We, we find 
whatever is the least stressful thing to do for our future selves. So we look at our past selves, and our past selves can teach us so much about the mistakes that we've made. And so we can take our current self to be less selfish in life. And instead of doing what's going to help the selfish current self do what they want to do, it's like, what can I do to serve my future self so my future self can be poised to serve anybody that God puts in our path? So that's where Take the LSD comes from. It's just a fun way to, to remember it. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that. They think it's the path of least resistance, and it's not. Uh, the best way to think of it is when you get on an airplane and they talk about if the oxygen mask comes down, put it on yourself first, then serve the person next to you. It's the same concept. So tell me about your wife and your family. She's my best buddy. We've been married 25 years this year, so she's my high school sweetheart. And we, we, we joke about this little thing where my mom got remarried. We got married in 1998, so you don't have to do the math, but my mom got remarried in 2002 to my father-in-law, which technically makes Kelly and I stepbrother and stepsister. On paper, to a child drawing his family tree, it looks like a wreath. So oh. it, it, we always had to explain that to the teachers, like he's, he's failing, you don't understand, it's the truth. So we've been married 25 years and siblings for 21. So tell me a funny story about your marriage. Oh, well, the, probably the funniest thing is that my wife can't hear. She's had progressive hearing loss since 2006, and that gets us in a lot of trouble. You know, so we started learning sign language, and we're horrible at it because it doesn't make any sense to do sign language unless everybody else does sign language with you. And but we learned the words like "fine," which is this. But I don't know if you know, the word "fine" means the same thing. But in our house, "fine" is a bad word. And so typically, if I ask, "Are you okay?" like she'll go like that. So if there's a flare, then she's not fun at all. And of course, your pride gets involved. And that's really the secret between us, is the reason. People will say stuff like, you don't know how lucky you are. You all have a great marriage. It's, like, it's because we put our pride and we put it away. And so if we have a problem, we know that we can speak truth and say, I have an issue. Here's the narrative. And that tells the other one, OK, I'm going to listen. And I'm going to ingest what I hear. I'm not going to get prideful. I'm not going to get defensive. And uh, that has been the LSD. So that's how we take the, the LSD. LSD. So from your marriage, you have a couple kids? We do, or nephews, however you want to look at that. Nephews. <laughs> we have two boys, 21 and 15, Mason and Dylan. Moody, tell me something funny about your kids. They're my minions. I can get them to do anything. So I could go to some place, and if I think of a fun idea, I could get them to go do it. Um, and and, and they, they just tr trust me enough to make it happen. Our neighbor messaged. Kelly and said, I had the worst dream. I was on a cruise ship with your youngest son, and he went over the side, and I could have saved him, but I didn't, and I watched him fall over the edge. And I looked over at Dylan, and he was probably 10 at the time. I said, I repeated what happened. And I goes, well, that's kind of weird. I said, hey, go to the door and just tell her, why did you let me go? And they just walk away. And so he did. <laughs> it was the best. So I like to mess with people, and I use these little kids to make it happen. Well, you know, I love how you use comedy in, in certain situations. And you really talked about, you know, be, you being bullying, and even as an adult. And we're going to talk about that when we come back. Moody, you talked about how you use comedy uh, to deal with your bullying and, and also as an adult, but how did your faith come into play along with your comedy and to get over some of these issues? To talk about the faith, we had to talk about where that came from. I was 15, I, was, I had a lot of peer pressure and I needed 
people to like me. And so that's where the comedy started it all, you know. But as I grew older, I was trying to get more friendships and I was extremely, uh, I was failing everywhere. I took the family car, which was parked at the house that was for sale that we were house sitting. Uh, I took it, so, and I crashed it. And I, I took it into a, a ditch and it rolled over and it, and it became half the size that it was and I was stuck in that car for three and a half hours mm. and they had to cut me out. So uh, my mom was called immediately afterwards and said, your son has been in a wreck. Meet us at the hospital. She goes, no, he's downstairs. And I'm like, no, we're looking at him. He's in a wreck. So she, she got to the hospital about eight minutes from a 30 minute ride, which is where I learned to drive is watching her. So that's probably why I didn't do real well. But once they got me out of the car, I had my, my uh, right leg was uh, shattered, my knee was where my hip was, my left foot was broken backwards around the steering wheel, my head had hit the windshield five times, and it looked like uh, the, the movie The Predator where the jaw was out like that and my torso was all cut up. And there was a guy named Scobie from Life Force, which is the, uh, the helicopter service in Chattanooga, had climbed into the wreckage to be with me those three and a half hours, and he was telling me yo mama jokes to keep me from passing out. And every time I would, he would say, don't laugh because you look like you got three mouths and it's quite disgusting, so just don't make that happen. So we finally get out and they're like, we got a bed for him at Children's. I'm like, this kid will not fit anything at Children's. Take him to Erlanger. And I get there and I don't know if you've ever tried to talk without a bottom jaw, but you can't. You know, it's just, it's very difficult to make any, uh, any, any words. We get to the hospital the doctor's like, your mom's here. She's been waiting for you three and a half hours because she's like, where's my kid? Where's my kid? And they're like, oh, they're still cutting him out of the car. So I'm sitting there like, you can't let in here because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mimic what it was like. So you can't let her in here. She's going to kill me. And she's like, no, we, it'll be fine. She wants to see us. And you know how stand I'm supposed to see downstairs because you know, I knew I snuck out and she will know I snuck out if I'm here with you. And uh, so he finally said, listen, if she tries to kill you, we'll bring you back to life. And I'm like, okay. And so that's, you know, that's where it all starts because I kept thinking, why did I live through that? Because I shouldn't have. I should have, I should have died. You were 15? Thing. I was 15. Yeah. No license. <clears throat> you sound like the cop. Yeah, <laughs> no, no license at all. It was a given. And uh, I, 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 you know, struggled with understanding what to do for the next several years of my life. And when I was 21, my neighbor from across the street uh, shared the gospel with me. And while I'd gone to Lutheran school, nothing ever really clicked because I was just trying to avoid getting teased or, or you know, uh, bullied in school. So I really never got into the gospel. So when I was 21, I, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and I learned more about it and got baptized when I was 23. And that's when my father found out, and he was Muslim, and he expected me to be Muslim because he was Muslim, and no one ever taught me about faith. They just expected I would learn it through osmosis. My mom was Methodist, and you know, Dad w wasn't. When they found out that I got baptized, he was very upset. Like, just because this happened doesn't mean you're not Muslim. You're born Muslim. You're, dead, you, you die Muslim. And so we had that, that, that was a big problem uh, between us, and eventually our, our relationship uh, separated because I had to choose following Jesus or following my dad and, and that was a pretty big breakup for us and our relationship just died uh, because of it so but that is where to understand why I chose that is because I I've, I've felt that I'm alive for some reason I didn't know what at the time but I think it's to bring laughter to people did you ever repair that relationship with your dad no I didn't Unfortunately, no, he passed away in 2006. How do you deal with that? It's difficult. Uh, I, I can see now as, as you know, I'm, I'm now the age that my father was when I was born. I can, I can see where he had very prideful thoughts. My mom had very prideful thoughts. And because they didn't work it out, that's why we were separated as a family. He stayed in Iran, and she's like, I'm going to take my kids away from uh, the revolution. But Dad had a really good standing in Iran. When we would travel back and forth, I remember we, he wanted to be in the line with the people. You know, and, the, and the guards were like, you're Dr. Monavi, you come with us. You don't have to stay in the four-hour line of 
customs. Go, no, 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 I want to be with the people. It's like, well, we're taking your bags, so you can go with your bags or you can stay in the line. So we really never had much to worry about because we were with him. You know, he was this top orthopedic surgeon. Everybody in Tehran loved him. He, uh, so he didn't come to the States when you No, were. no. So, so not growing up with a dad was a big problem. You know, that's, that's what led to a lot of the, the codependence peer you know, uh, issues that I, that I wanted, uh, friendship all the time. But the, uh, the, the path to faith was learning that uh, all I really needed was, was Jesus in my life and, and, and serving the people that he puts in my path. And I learned that every day a little bit more. And I, I find to yoke with people that are positive and not negative. You know, I can love the negative people from afar, but the ones that I, I need closest to me is the ones that can build me up. Because it's, it's tough, you're, you know, especially when you're doing stuff entertaining people, you'll hear the negative comments more than you will the positive, and, the, and you have to be aligned with the positive people because I don't believe God ever speaks in negative thoughts. I believe that is where the devil comes in. And he has to shout, and God never does. He just whispers. And so if I can tune out the negative thoughts, I can listen to God's whisper to know where, what I'm supposed to be doing next. Do you feel like as an adult, though, that you still have those bullying issues with people? Easily, yeah. Uh, and for different reasons. Um, traveling around, doing comedy in different uh, venues, if I'm not a specific person, you know, or, or, or meet a specific demographic immediately, you're judged. And that's really people go to the comedy club. Some people go to judge and heckle and they want to really be part of the show, uh, even though they paid for someone else to see it. But the, uh, yeah, you run into that a lot. And it's not just about being Iranian, it's about, you know, uh, being fat. You know, I'm, I'm bigger than anybody that I know. Uh, and, and that's a big thing. It's one of the, the two disabilities that people don't understand is uh, uh, hearing loss. They get mad, mad at you about that. Like my wife, she can't hear, and people get upset, and they have to keep repeating. And uh, when when you don't fit in someone's car, you know, like when Enterprise tried to pick me up in their little Kia, and they're like, no, and they just kept driving away. So it's there's there's a lot of prejudices, and it doesn't have to all be because I'm Iranian. Most people don't know I'm Iranian until they see my name, and then you know it's over. Moody. In the midst of all the issues that you've dealt with, the bullying, um, God has a tremendous plan for you, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. Moody, tell me where God's leading you now. Oh, that is a really interesting thing. So our company is called Motivation because it's just a fun way of saying motivation. And I typically talk about three major pieces when I get to do like a corporate show or a church show. One of them is take the LSD, which we talked about. And that's throughout all of our life is, is what can I do to serve my future self so that he can be uh, well poised to serve people God puts in his path. The other one is... Uh, MSU, where people make stuff up and, and challenge that. So, so when someone says, but we've always done it this way, that's, that's one of those things like, okay, but why do we do this way? I love to learn about the why. I'm that annoying kid that will ask why five or six times to get to the root cause. So the third thing is human, I thank you. If you look at the word humanity, it's, it's, it's the word human, and then I and TY, I was texting it one day and I saw it. I was like, oh, look at that, humanity, human ITY, human I thank you. 
This is a concept that people, I want them to learn. I want them to understand that everybody has value and no one should be compared to anybody else. Everybody is incomparable. And so how do we do that? So we make sure that every interaction that we have with people, we say, okay, I need to make sure this person feels valuable. So I may ask them something along the lines of, do you remember when you first decided to do this job, when it was offered to you? And I want you to think about that time. I want you to think about the elation that was around it, where you got to say yes. And I want you to tell me about that. If you're comfortable through that, tell me about that piece. Do you mind if we do that real quick with you? Like when you decided to do this, this job of, of this show, can you, you don't have to go into detail about it, but just do you remember that day when you decided to say, yes, this is what I'm gonna go do? Do I remember that exact day? That, that moment when you decided this is it, this is what I'm gonna go do. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I want you to hold on to that and I want you to think about it. And I want to say thank you for saying yes, because if you didn't say yes to that, you and I would have never met. We would have never had this opportunity to learn more about each other, to see how God wants us to work together. So that's the basis of human I thank you. All those three things go to make motivation. And what we want to do, Kelly and I really have it on our heart to serve the unplanned pregnancies. And this is, people can make it political, but at the end of the day, it's humans. So how do we make the humans feel valuable? One thing I've never seen people do is foster the mother with the child. So how do we do that? So that's where we want to create this company, this uh, nonprofit called We Got You. Nothing new. We just want to bring different agencies and people and volunteers and everything together to be the central hub where we can say there's a person that has a problem and she needs support. She needs to feel that someone's got her. So we got you. And, and if it's a, the, the, all the socioeconomic stuff, you know, all the, the shunning or uh, I'm not going to be able to continue education. I'm not going to continue my career. All those reasons why people have so much stress about an unplanned birth. So what can we do? What can, how can we help that person? How can we help and come alongside them and support them? In the foster system today, there's just so much that's not right with it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I feel would be helpful is if that child had an opportunity to be raised with his mom and give her every bit of support possible. And if it means for Kelly and I to take on another niece, you know, into our life and, and say, hey, this is, we're gonna make sure that you get the support that you need, whatever that entails, and we will go reach out to work from home agencies to uh, schooling from home. Today, in 2023, the, the options are limitless. So let's, let's tap into that. And I've been in the technology industry for 25 years. I've got a lot of contacts, and I think we can make it happen. So it's just a matter of getting people that want to serve, but they don't know how to, to people that need service and they don't know where to get it. So this is starting now. Well, right now it's a concept and it came up this past summer uh, or last summer and we don't know how we're gonna make it happen. But it, what's really interesting is every show that comes to me that says, hey, can you come and do a show for us? They all have a little piece of this pie. Like, oh, we could use this organization to fill this need. We could use this one to fill this need. And so it's really interesting. So this is totally, led by God in our opinion, because everybody that we're meeting fits into the same ultimate service to another human. I love that. You've got your comedy, this ministry, um, and you said IT. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the bread and butter. So uh, you'll, you'll hear people say, if you, get to, if you get paid doing what you love, then that's awesome. So Moody, what would you say to somebody that's listening today about their value and what God is, wants them to hear? So I have a lot of struggles. I struggle with uh, weight. I struggle with um, not feeling uh, worth to people. And I struggle with uh, uh, just not being understood. And through all of that, God gave me humor. And so I can go out and I can make people laugh. You know, uh, we had a show in uh, McMinnville, Tennessee this past winter, big banquet hall, 300 people, and they had these little chairs that 
I don't know who created them, but it wasn't for anybody of any size. Everybody was sitting on the edge, afraid they were going to fall apart. You've seen them at weddings. They're, they're basically toothpicks and plastic put together. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm kind of testing it out. Like, I'm making a joke. I'm like, you know, you guys are really scared about all this. I'm the biggest guy here. Have some faith. These things are working. And at that moment, I was wrong. Then the seat just collapsed, and I splatted. And that's when we learned I didn't bounce. So some person from two tables away jumps up to come help. And now you're embarrassed. You've just splattered. You're supposed to go speak in front of these people, make them laugh. And now everybody's like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Like, how he must feel terrible. And they just witnessed this embarrassing moment. And he's come up to help me. And I don't like it when people ask me if I'm OK, when I obviously I'm not. So don't ever ask that question. I don't know why people do that. But I, I, I jumped up really quickly. And which I didn't expect, but my mind was thinking I have a new Apple Watch and it tattletales on me. It tells the emergency crews that, hey, he's down. And then they all come running. I don't know if you know that about the iOS system now, but it's, it's quite embarrassing if, if you fall a lot. But so here, this guy's helping me. I jump up and I grab the chair that was next to me that wasn't broken and I, and I made it look at the other one. I'm like, don't you do what he did or oh, you'll get some of the same, you know? So I was trying to make this fun because I was extremely embarrassed. And I sit back down this time on the edge of the new seat. And the lady that was at her table, she's a nurse. And I was like, by the way, you're a nurse, are you not? And she said, I am. I said, why didn't you come help? She goes, but you got up so fast. I was like, oh, it wasn't that fast. I said, well, what are you even nurse? She said, hospice. I said, oh, well, so that's not in your wheelhouse. Like, they never get back up. She goes, no, they Aww. don't. So I, I, I use, I don't know, I find the humor in things to offset all the, all the stuff. So to your question, what would I tell people is, is all that other stuff doesn't matter. You know, if, whatever you're calling as mine, I feel, is humor. Um, that and also helping little people come closer to God because if they come on a plane... Uh, people that don't pray will always pray, like, please don't let them sit next to me. And, and I feel that's another calling I have for them. Uh, don't worry about all the stuff that's outside. You know, you, you've, got, you've got something on your heart. You've got a message that God has that he wants you to share. Just share it and see where it goes. Moody, thank you so much. What a pleasure it is to sit down with you. Keep making people laugh. Thank you. My friend, are you comparing yourself to others? Jesus wants you to know that you are worthy, you are enough, and you are loved. This is today's Nashville. This is Faith.